Python 3.13 continues a number of trends within the language itself. Some of these changes are likely to change the way we all program for years to come. Well, I'm not going to cover all changes within the language, since that video would probably be about 8 hours long, here are the things I think you should know about Python 3.13. First, we'll start off going over some new features, and in these are some of those big changes I was talking about. While the first one isn't as major, it's still a nice one to have, the improved interactive interpreter. But we follow that up immediately with the biggest change to the language covered in this release, free threading. Another larger change follows that with the JIT compiler. And they cover some other things like the new CLI for random module, adding deprecations in argparse, and then changing how locals works. So let's start off with the interactive interpreter. And instead of just reading through these, let's actually demonstrate the changes with the side-by-side -side between the two versions. On the left, we have Python 3.12.5, which is currently installed on my system. And on the right, we have Python 3.13, technically release candidate 2, because this is being recorded shortly before 3.13 is officially released. One of the big changes here was multi-line editing. And if you're used to working with the REPL now, then you're probably familiar with this type of scenario where you have some code where you define some type of class or function but you realize you need to make a change to it before 313 if you were to press up within the REPL it would go up line by line and you can't really edit the class how you'd like to say changing this variable from test to changed it's not going to work however in 313 when we press up we immediately get the entire class because it understands that context we were in. So now we can change that to changed and it works perfectly fine. That's a huge plus. Another big improvement to this multi-line editing is that the new REPL understands the indentation that we should be at. If we were to also define say a test function in 3.12, when we go to the new line, it puts us back at the original indentation. So it's manually indent. I have to press the space bar four times each time that I want to write a line in this function. However, in Python 3.13, when we're in this test function and I hit enter, it immediately brings us down to the correct indentation for that function scope. Much better. Now transition to another improvement in 3.13, we can run clear and that clears our window. If we were to try that in 3.13, it's not going to work, even running it as a function. So for that, I have to rely on my own terminal to do that clearing. You may have already noticed that they've introduced color into the prompts with 3.13 compared to 3.12. And that's also true when it comes to tracebacks. If you were to run 5 divided by 0, clearly that's not going to work. And now we see significant improvements in Python 3.13. Not only does it give us nice color output, but it also tells us exactly where the error happens. Much clearer. This is one of those continuous improvements that we're seeing within the language when it comes to presentation of tracebacks. Before 3.13, in order to get help, you had to run help like a function. Now you can just say help. It also continues this trend when it comes to exiting the REPL itself. In older versions, if you forgot and tried to type quit or exit, it would tell you you have to run that as a function. Well, now in 3.13, you can just type quit and it brings you right back out. Same thing for exit. That may seem relatively minor, but for people that don't regularly use the REPL, this is a pretty big annoyance. Okay, let's stop comparing the two and instead get to things that are net new to Python 3.13. The first one is we can now press the F1 key to trigger that interactive help that we saw before. And in here, if we were to get help for specific modules, we can put in modules. And this will give us a list of all the modules we can get help for. For example, Pathlib. We can see a bunch of information about the module itself and what it offers. Additionally, if we want to look at topics, we can see a list of topics we can get information about. Like tuples. You get a whole bunch of information about tuples. Okay. Leaving the help text, we can also press F2 to get our input history. Here you just see the few things that we have put in the interpreter so far. While maybe not as useful, one thing that is significantly more useful is using F3 to enter paste mode. And in this paste mode, it allows us to easily paste in a chunk of code. And after we're done, 
we just hit enter and now we have this basic class available to us pretty nice right okay that's enough about the interactive interpreter for now for this and for anything else we're going to cover in this video if you want to know more about something let me know and i may do a follow-up video on it one of those things that i think definitely deserves a follow-up video at some point is free threading now a big word of caution for this in 313 is that this is still experimental so i wouldn't use this in any type of production environment especially if you care about things working every time so for these free threading builds to see if you have one available you're going to look for python 313 with a t at the end if you don't see that then you're going to have to build it from source with disable gil and as that flag alludes to in free threading the gil is disabled a reminder here is that gil stands for global interpreter lock i won't get into the history of the gil or really the history of this project but i'll just summarize the history to say that this is something that people have been trying in a number of different ways for many years so this being introduced this officially in 313 is a huge deal for the language itself now just because free threading exists doesn't mean that everything is going to work better in fact what we've been seeing is that single threaded performance is actually decreased without the gill however for properly designed multi-threaded programs you could see a substantial performance boost the key here being properly designed because with the gill disabled you have to manually acquire and release locks to ensure that your threads are not interfering with each other one thing you can do to check to see if you're in this mode is you can look into the value of sys.version to see if free threading is enabled. Okay, speaking of experimental, new, somewhat radical change to the language is the JIT compiler or the just-in-time compiler. So this is actually a tier two interpreter, which takes it another step beyond the normal tier one interpreter responsible for bytecode generation. Again, we're not gonna get into the specifics in this video, but we could do that another time if you like. For this, you will have to build it with the option enable experimental JIT. And there are four optional values you can pass into this. The value no means you don't want to build the JIT and the tier two interpreter. This is the equivalent of just not passing this option in general, but this is more of an explicit no. If you do pass the option without a value, it effectively works as a flag, meaning the default value of yes is passed in and this will both build and enable the JIT. If you pass in the value yes dash off, it will build the JIT, but keep it disabled. And then finally, if you pass in the value interpreter, it will both build and enable the tier two interpreter, but not the JIT. So a lot of flexibility in the way that you can build Python with this new option. Additionally, you can control the JIT behavior at runtime with the Python JIT environment variable. And this environment variable's value should be set to either a zero or a one. All right, let's look into the new CLI for random. And for this, we're gonna head back to our CLI so you can see what it looks like when we actually run this. Now that we're in our Python 313 system, we can run python-m random. And this will give us the help text for the module. So we see we have a few options available as well as positional arguments we can pass in. For example, if we were to just pass in, this is a test sentence, random is going to randomly choose one of the words from this sentence. And in these examples, it definitely seems weighted towards the beginning of the sentence for whatever reason. Maybe more useful than that is generating random numbers. So if we run Python random and then pass in the upper bound of the numbers we want to generate, it'll go ahead and generate those random numbers. Now keep in mind these numeric values start at one. So you should never get a zero out of this. You can also do this for floating point numbers. So we just put in dot zero zero there. And now we're getting floating point numbers. Pretty nice. If we want to be explicit, we can tell it to choose from those list of words that we gave before. For example, here, we'll run this and it'll choose one of the words in that sentence. You can also specify an integer value. This time we'll give it 25. And if instead we want to change it to a float value, we can just pass in float. And we don't have to use that decimal notation. So this is a nice little utility that has been added in 313. 
and while it might not be as flashy as some of the others, in my opinion, I may end up using this with some type of script in the future. All right, now let's talk about deprecations in arc parse. And I don't mean and I don't mean things that are being deprecated within the arc parse module, but your ability to now specify options, arguments, or subcommands that are going to be deprecated to your CLI users. And what this will do is that if they try to use that option, argument, or subcommand, it will print out a warning. And the way we do this is through two new optional arguments for add argument and add parser, simply stating deprecated is equal to true. And once you do that, Python will take care of the rest. All right, so this next change, I don't think is gonna affect most people, at least not directly, unless you were exploiting this behavior, which I wouldn't recommend either, because there's a lot of inconsistency with the behavior around locals between different Python implementations. So it was never a reliable interface to do some of the weirder things you could have done with locals in the past. Well, now this has changed. Each time that you call locals, it now returns an independent snapshot. And what I mean by independent is that it won't affect any future calls within that same scope. So each time you call locals, it will gather the local variables and values at that time and then return it. This change also affects how locals and globals in exec and eval work. Meaning if you're trying to modify globals using exec in the past, you're likely going to have to switch to passing something like a locals dictionary to it. Now the key change here is to be consistent between Python implementations, and it also makes live editing a bit easier for debuggers. And another small bonus thing here is the addition of Dunder static attributes. So this actually happens during compilation time. and It tracks which attributes are being accessed from self within a class. In the example below, my class's static attributes only contains the attribute another and not some adder because we never call self dot some adder within this class. Now that's a really interesting thing here is because it actually goes down into the methods that are being defined within a class to figure out which attributes are being used. Now, most of us are likely never to really use this in any significant way, but for people implementing tools that need to determine an object size, this is going to be quite helpful. All right. There's many more new things that have been added within Python 3.13. Let's get into some of the important things that have been removed in 3.13. And PEP 5.9.4 removes a number of modules. I'm not going to read all these, but you can see the ones affected on screen now. So if you're using any of these, please keep in mind that you have some work to do before you can upgrade to 3.13. Some other things that have been removed in 3.13 is the tool 2-3, as well as lib 2-3. Additionally, tkinter.tix, locale.resetlocale, typing.io and typing.re. You also can no longer chain class method descriptors. Now some newly announced deprecations are get opt and opt parser. These have been soft deprecated. And soft deprecation means that it's not going to be explicitly removed from the language at this time or in the near future. However, they're no longer going to actively maintain these and it's recommended that you use an alternative. In this case, arg parse. For the regular expressions module, max split, count, and flags are being moved to being keyword only in Python 3.15. Also in Python 3.15, SQLite 3 has also been affected, namely that you can't pass more than one positional argument to connect, and that the connection classes create function and create aggregate are moving some of their keyword arguments to positional only in 3.15. Okay, these next few items are going to be primarily for the people that maintain C-based Python libraries. So if that's not you, you can feel free to drop in the video from here, unless you're just interested in some of the things that have been changed from the C API. So luckily for people using the C API, most of the changes in this release are additions. However, there are some important changes as well as removals in 3.13. For example, these functions have significant changes. So if you're using them, please check the release notes to find out more. That last part there, pi code get first free, is now being moved to pi unstable code get first free because they've determined that the function itself is unstable, as the name suggests. Additionally, the following functions now report errors via sys.unraisable hook. Continuing with removals, 
They say several functions prefixed with underscore pi have been removed, as well as anyone using old buffer protocols must use the new buffer objects. Plus, these are some additional functions that have been removed, as well as suggestions of what to replace these calls with. There are a few more things removed within 3.13, so please take some time to read through the rest of this. One thing that could be concerning here is the removal of the PyTime header file. Also, a number of new deprecations have been announced, and reminders about pending removals in 3.14 and 3.15. And if you're a C-based library maintainer, I know it can be difficult, so on a personal note, thank you for taking the time to keep these working on newer versions of Python. And with that said, thanks for watching and enjoy the new release.